Greetings from the great state of Alaska. My name is Dr. G, and today I want to share with you a message of hope. You know, today is January 20th, 2021. It's Inauguration Day. This is the day that President Trump leaves office and the new president, new vice president, take the oath of office. So the new president, Joe Biden, and Vice President Kamala Harris, uh, they were sworn in today into their new positions. And one thing that I'm concerned with as they begin to take these new positions, Joe Biden had said, uh, let me just read this. This is on Fox News. It says, Biden is to sign 17 executive actions and orders to reverse Trump policies and restore Obama-era programs on the first day. And so this causes me concern because I think back to some of the Obama-era policies, and, and these policies were not good for the country. Furthermore, these policies were not good for the church. And so as I think about this, um, one of the policies that jumps out at me, and, and I mean, there's several, uh, you know, the Paris Climate Agreement, uh, Biden wants to get us back into that. He wants to stop uh, the construction on the, the Mexico-United uh, States border wall. Um, there's a lot of things like that, but the one that really jumps out, and I'm going to read it here, it says, Joe Biden vows to sign executive order reversing U.S. President Trump's pro-life policies. And so that should cause you concern as well, because the God that we serve is a God that is pro-life. He's a God that is full of life. Matter of fact, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And when a nation or a group of people decide that it's okay to take something that God has created, to take a life, and to destroy a life, that generally precedes judgment. That, that's not a good place to be. And, you know, all, we've been talking about the divine attributes of God. I think we talked quite a bit about uh, the justice of God, that God is a God of justice. He's a God of righteousness. We said that his throne is founded on the pillars of justice and righteousness. But justice and righteousness also um, lead to judgment. So today I want to talk to you a little, a little bit about judgment. judgment. And if you have your Bibles, if you turn to the book of Acts, chapter 17, verse 1. <clears throat> Let me find it here. It says, God has appointed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by the man whom he has ordained. He has given assurance of this to all by raising him from the dead. Let me read that once again. He, God has appointed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness. And so one thing that we need to make a note of is that the world has an appointment with judgment. The world has an appointment with justice. Now, if you have your Bibles, you're also welcome to turn to Hebrews chapter 9, verse 27. I'm not going to go there. I, I have the scripture memorized. But it says in Hebrews 9, 27 that it is appointed unto man once to die, and after this the judgment. So you see, mankind also has an appointment. with death and judgment. And so this is referring to, to man as an individual. This is referring to the world. So I, I think you can see that judgment is inevitable. It's inevitable. We are going to be judged. You know, if we go back to the book of Genesis... I want to look at a time where God judged the world. Okay, 
And I'm going to be reading out of the, the message. This is kind of a, uh, it's not a translation as much as it is a, um, a different version of the Bible that is put into contemporary language. But I think the story reads well. I'm going to read it here. Genesis chapter 6, verses 5 through 8. It says, God saw that human evil was out of control. People thought evil. They imagined evil. Evil, evil, evil from morning to night. God was sorry that he had made the human race in the first place. It broke his heart. God said, I'll get rid of my ruined creation. I'll make a clean sweep. People, animals, snakes, bugs, birds, the works. I'm sorry I made them. You see, God was upset with what he saw on earth. He's seen the evil. And today I don't think it's much different. I think God looks upon earth and he sees the violence. He sees the corruption. He sees the evil. And I think his heart is broke. And so in Genesis chapter 6, God's heart was broke. God decided he was going to judge the earth. It says here in verse 8, But Noah was different. God liked what he saw in Noah. So there was something unique about Noah that stood out in God's mind. And, and I'm sure there's something unique about individuals on this earth that stands out in God's mind. There's this group of Christians, this group of believers that we often see referred to as the remnant. The remnant. Noah was kind of the remnant. It says here in verse 9 through 10, this is the story of Noah. Noah was a good man, a man of integrity in his community. Noah walked with God. Noah had three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. As far as God was concerned, the earth had become a sewer. There was violence everywhere. God took one look and he saw how bad it was. Everyone corrupt and corrupting life itself, corrupt to the core. God said to Noah, it's all over. It's the end of the human race. The violence is everywhere. I'm going to make a clean sweep. And so here we see that God had decided to judge the earth. He was going to bring judgment and just destroy it, wipe it away. But you see, God had a plan. Even in God's judgment, God provides the knowledge of salvation. And in this verse, God provides the knowledge of salvation to Noah. He said, build yourself a ship from teak wood. Make rooms in it. Coat it with pitch, inside and out. Make it 450 feet long, 75 feet wide, 45 feet high. Build a roof for it. And he, God begins to describe the ship or the boat. God says, I'm going to bring a flood on the earth that will destroy everything alive under heaven. Total destruction. But I'm going to establish a covenant with you. You'll board the ship and your sons, your wife and your wife's sons, or your son's wives, and they will come on board with you. You also will take two of every living creature. So then God begins to describe the plan of salvation to Noah. And so it's really no different today. We have a plan of salvation today. And that, that salvation comes through Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is, is our ship of safety. He's our ark, so to speak. And so God has not left us knowledgeless. He's given us a knowledge of salvation. Now I want to go to another scripture. This is also in the book of Genesis. This is after the flood. This is after the earth was destroyed and then man began to increase in number uh, after the flood. So in Genesis chapter 11 verses 1 through 4 it says, At one time the whole earth spoke the same language. It so happened that as they moved out of the east, they came upon a plain in the land of Shinar, and they settled down. And they said to one another, Come, let's make bricks and fire them well. They used the brick for stone and tar for mortar. 
And then they said, come, let's build ourselves a city and a tower that reaches heaven. Let's make ourselves famous so we won't be scattered here and there across the earth. So I'm going to stop there for a moment. Did God tell man to build this tower of Babel? Did God tell man to do that? No, he didn't. Did God tell Noah to build an ark of safety? Yes, he did. And you see, sometimes man does things without God's approval. Sometimes man does things without God's blessing and God's direction. And in verse 11, uh, chapter 11, we read how this group of people began to build this Tower of Babel that reached up to the heavens. You see, man was attempting to create his own vehicle of salvation. Man was basically constructing his own ark of safety by building a tower that would reach higher than a flood could ever reach. Man was trying to create in his own escape from judgment. And Josephus, he's a historian, he's, he points to the main reasons that Nimrod ordered the construction of the Tower of Babel, and that was to create a structure tall enough to withstand another worldwide flood, just like the one we've seen in Genesis chapter 6. And so this is the first reference we see to, to Babylon. It's this Tower of Babel. And so we see a lot of references to Babylon in the Bible. Uh, there's actually four perspectives on Babylon. I'm going to share those with you. First of all, Babylon represents a type of rejection. You see, when the people in Genesis chapter 11 began to build this tower, they were rejecting God's salvation and they were creating their own path of salvation. So I want to write these down. Uh, Babylon <clears throat> put it right here rejection one of the characteristics of Babylon is rejection rejecting God's plan rejecting God's ways rejecting God's law rejecting God's order it's rejection and so whenever you read about Babylon there's always this rejection of the things of God uh, in Jeremiah chapter 51, verses uh, 6 through 8, let me get my other Bible here. The prophet says, Flee from the midst of Babylon, and everyone save his life. Do not be cut off in her iniquity, for this is the time of the Lord's vengeance. He shall recompense her. Babylon was a golden cup, in the Lord's hand that made all the earth drunk the nations drank her wine therefore the nations are deranged Babylon has suddenly fallen and been destroyed wail for her take balm for her pain and so the prophet describes the fall of Babylon and we have to remember that through the book of Jeremiah we see that God's people chose to worship idols they chose to intermarry with the other nations of the world at that time and they they basically were involved in fornication they 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 left the true god they they forsook him and they went after other gods and so fornication is another characteristic of babylon fornication now we're going to get to the third uh, characteristic of Babylon. This is found in Daniel chapter 4. I'm not going to go there because it would take me too long, but basically in Daniel chapter 4, we read about Babylon. We read about Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon. And Nebuchadnezzar was a very, uh, very proud, arrogant king. And he bragged and and he, he just kind of had this air about him. He didn't give credit to God. He Nebuchadnezzar just took the glory for himself and and God gave Nebuchadnezzar a dream and in that dream uh, the meaning of the dream was that Nebuchadnezzar was going to be humbled and we read that Nebuchadnezzar he lost his mind he became like a, a cattle 
He began to eat grass in the field. He, he was struck down, but there was pride in Nebuchadnezzar's heart. And whenever there's pride, the Bible says, a pride cometh before the fall. There's always destruction and a fall. And so a third characteristic of Babylon is pride. Pride. The last one I'm going to read about or, or share with you, this is in the book of Revelation. Let's go to Revelation. Revelation chapter 14. I'm going to go into uh, the New Living. This has got very small print. Revelation chapter 14, verses 6 through 11. It says, I saw another angel flying through the sky, carrying the eternal good news to proclaim to the people who belong to this world, to every nation, tribe, language, and people. Fear God, he shouted. Give glory to God, for the time has come when he will sit as judge. Now we know that God is going to judge the world through Jesus Christ. And so Jesus is referring to Jesus Christ. Worship him who made the heavens, the earth, the sea, and all the springs of water. Then another angel followed him through the sky shouting, Babylon is fallen. That great city is fallen because she made all the nations of the world drink the wine of her passionate immorality. Then a third angel followed them, shouting, Anyone who worships the beast and his statue or who accepts his mark on the forehead or on the hand must drink the wine of God's anger. It has been poured full strength into God's cup of wrath. And they will be tormented with fire and burning sulfur in the presence of the holy angels and the Lamb. The smoke of their torment will rise forever and ever, and they will have no relief day or night, for they have worshipped the beast and his statue and have accepted the mark of his name. So we see here that for those who united with Babylon, those who united with Babylon and pledged allegiance to the beast, there was an eternal damnation that was pronounced by this holy angel. Now I would say to you that <laughs> what we're seeing in our, in our world today, and specifically in the United States, we're seeing this call for unity. Be careful what you unite with. Be careful who you unite under. Verse 12, God's holy people must endure persecution patiently, obeying his commands and maintaining their faith in Jesus. You see, we want to unite with Jesus Christ. We don't want to unite with this world. We don't want to unite with Babylon. We don't want to unite with the leaders of Babylon. We want to unite with Jesus Christ. And so what we see in the book of Revelation when it talks about Babylon, we really see full-on rebellion. It's not just rejection at this point. It's full-on rebellion. It's... it's uh, a secular humanism. It's uh, the arrogance of accomplishment apart from God. It's, it's man going it alone and completely rebelling against the rule of God, the morality of God, the order of God. And so these are the four characteristics of Babylon. Now, many say that Babylon was, was just an ancient city built on the Euphrates River. Some say that in the book of Revelation, when it talks about Babylon, it's referring to ancient Rome. Others think it refers to Jerusalem or, or the Catholic Church or even the United States. But probably the, the view that gets the most uh, agreement is that Babylon is a worldwide global anti-God system. A worldwide global anti-God system. And, you know, that's really the path that America is going to take now under the Biden and Harris administration. We're going to see this return to globalism. We're going to see this return to a one world, or at least a pursuit of a one world government, a one world church, or a one world religion. 
and a one world economy. It's many refer to this as the Great Reset, and it's a little bit uh, concerning for me, and it should be concerning for you. So I go back to our original uh, supposition that God is going to judge the world. The world has an appointment with judgment. The United States has an appointment with judgment. And you and I, we have an appointment with death and then judgment. You know, judgment involves many things. Let's just talk about it for just a moment. Uh, judgment involves God's justice and righteousness being uh, enacted, right? Because ultimately, when a judge makes a decision, he, he looks at the facts and he makes a decision concerning those facts. And, and that's what's going to happen. God is going to look at the facts. He's going to look at the choices that America is making. He's going to look at the choices that we're making as a nation and that we're making as a government. And then he's going to look at the choices that we've made as individuals. And we're going to be judged. And I'm going to talk more about that at another, another time. I believe what I've shared with you today communicates a pretty good understanding of, of judgment. It's in, inevitable. Let me just write that down. Judgment is inevitable. You can build the highest tower, but you're not going to escape judgment. There's an appointment. You can't change the appointment that God has set. Babylon, we've described it with these four characteristics, and we've said in the book of Revelation, it is a worldwide global anti-God system. It is not simply an ancient city on the banks of the Euphrates River. So today, I want you to think about this. Think about the choices and that you're making as an individual. Think about your choices. Unity, I'm just going to write this up here, and I'm going to put a couple of question marks here. Think about what you're uniting around. Because if you choose to unite with the wrong person or the wrong thing, it could lead to destruction on the day of judgment. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you today that your judgment is just. That your judgment is right. And God, I just thank you today that you've given us the knowledge of salvation. That that knowledge of salvation revolves around Jesus Christ. And I'm so thankful that, Lord Jesus, when you judge us, that you're going to be able to look upon us and know whether or not we've entered the ark of safety. You're going to know whether or not, whether or not we've accepted you as our Savior and our Lord. And God, I just pray that the decisions we make individually, corporately, and even as a church, I pray that our decisions, oh God, our godly decisions that bring us to a place of good standing on the day of judgment. Lord, we pray for our country and our nation as we enter into this next phase of, of leadership here in the United States, leadership under uh, a group of people that have not historically been pro-life. And so, God, I just pray that you would cause their hearts and their minds to change. Cause them to change their position on abortion. And to change their position on a lot of these policies and issues. So that they might bring the nation into alignment with your purposes for the United States of America. Lord, we give you the praise and the glory. We thank you again for your word. We thank you for your righteous judgment, for your mercies. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you.